So the economy, school, the culture, um, what's happening in Washington, D.C., the 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 wild unpopularity for uh, Joe Biden all played a role. But one of the big things that everyone was talking about across the country as they were coming out of the uh, polls was the economy. And the supply chain is really hard to understand. I was having uh, dinner with a friend, Jim Lentz. He is um, he he's been the head of you were the head of Toyota for how long? Uh, sales side about six years and about seven years CEO for North America. Okay, so mm-hmm. he was the CEO for Toyota uh, Motor Corporation of North America and the chief operating officer of the parent company in Japan. Um, he is he he was he was there for all of the big things, including the move from California to Texas, Plano, Texas. Uh, and also you were there for the big earthquake yes. um, in Japan, which I, I think would play a little bit of a role that you could learn from now on supply chain issues. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Okay, so can you explain the supply chain to the audience like you did to me uh, when I asked you? I said, so I, what, what is happening with the supply chain? Sure. So the biggest thing to understand is supply chain is a system. And there are a lot of different components to it. And it really starts with forecasting and ordering what you think. So as, as a manufacturer, I have to forecast what my future needs of automobiles will be. I place that manufacturing order, and let's say something that's being produced overseas. It gets produced, it gets shipped, it gets processed at the port, it then gets transported, whether it gets trucked to the ultimate uh place of sale or a warehouse, Mm -hmm. or it gets moved into a rail yard and then it gets railed, uh, and eventually it gets sold. So the challenge is when the supply chain breaks down, uh, all of that has to operate in sync. If you concentrate as we are today on just the port operations, you're just going to move that supply chain problem further down the road. Because let's just, and I'm sure it doesn't work this way, but let's just say, you have shipment of a whole bunch of steering wheels coming in. Well, what are you going to do with all the steering wheels? Because you're missing the chips because the chips aren't in. Right. You need all of them to come in in an ordered way, right? right? Right. And can you explain how sophisticated the supply chain is for fa- for factories like Toyota? Yeah. Well, you know, so literally the, the Japanese kind of invented just in time. And just in time means when I build a vehicle in my plant, Literally, the part that goes on that truck may only arrive hours before production. In fact, our, our plant here in Texas that builds the Tundra, uh, we actually have suppliers on site, the seat supplier. So they will build their seats in the same sequence that I build my vehicle. So that seat literally arrives maybe 20 minutes before it needs to to be able to go down that line. And I think the biggest thing as a result of all this Lean manufacturing was created to take waste out of the system. So you didn't have to warehouse 30 and 60 days worth of parts. Because when, when you were at Ford, this is many years ago, almost 40 years ago, when you were at Ford, you, you told me that there were times when you ran out of the right color seats, but that was just it. That's right. You put in whatever you had at the end of the year. So, so, you know, the world's gotten away from that. But the big question that, that COVID in this supply chain crisis has created is can lean manufacturing as we know it today, just in time, literally hours before it's needed, is that the best way to go? Or are we going to need to go backwards a little bit, create more warehousing so we don't have these big glitches? It's going to be interesting to see how this gets fixed because – there's, there's an old adage in the car business, and that is when things were going wrong, you'd say the bull is in the ditch. And the big question is not how the bull got there, not whose fault it was, not how you're going to keep him out of the ditch in the future. The question is, how do you get him out of the ditch today? So today, we need to be concentrating our efforts on the supply chain in these ports and how can we get these ports cleared as quickly as possible? So I've talked to the head of the truckers, uh, independent truckers. They say there's not a shortage of trucks. There's a shortage of place to put stuff. Uh, and they say the trucks, the reason why they have problems with truckers is sometimes these truckers 
will wait eight hours mm-hmm. at a port, and they're not getting paid for that. They're not getting paid to wait. So right. what is the problem? How, If you were president, how would you be fixing this? Uh, I would go to somewhere like Wharton and get a systems expert on logistics to go down to the port and observe exactly what's happening. Where, where are the bottlenecks? Is the bottleneck trucks coming into the port? Is the bottleneck trucks going out of the port? Is the bottleneck how many, how many cranes we have to move it? Uh, I mean, there are so many issues. And, and if you look at Long Beach as an example, um, they've been processing roughly 18,000 containers a day. Jeez. There are 29,000 containers a day arriving. Oh, my gosh. And, and, you know, as I started to research this for your show today, you can go back to March, and there was a huge backlog in March. So this didn't just take place last month. Mm. This has been going on for some time. There and are f- nobody did anything. No, and there, there are, there are 540,000 containers sitting on ships waiting to be processed. Oh, my gosh. So, so and only 18,000 being be. processed. So, so if, if you look at those numbers, you've got to increase your, your throughput by 60% just to keep up with what's coming, not even to cut into the backlog of what you have there. So the, the only way to tackle this is to look at the entire system. How can we improve the efficiency every step along the way? Because if, if for example, I find a way to work 24-7 at every term, terminal, and I start putting out all these containers. Well, your next problem is going to be at the railhead. You're right. not going to have you're not going to have enough trains to move the merchandise. And then if you fix that problem, then where are you going to put all this stuff? You're not going to have the warehouse space. If you go into Walmart today and there's something that's not in stock, and you say, "Well, do you have it in the back room?" There isn't a back room. Right. So, so this. That's why, like our supermarkets, are are restocked. Like, what is it? Like, something created like 18 times a day. Yeah. Because it's just in time, right? Yeah. They They predict when they're going to be mm-hmm. out of these products. Yeah. I mean, it happens at our plants. I mean, literally, at one end of the plant, we'll have parts arrive. And literally, within hours, it is taken from there, and it's put on the assembly line. Uh, rarely do parts sit for a very long period of time. Well, that seems like an impossible problem to fix because you have to fix it from both ends. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff in these 540,000 containers are not going to be used right away. It Right? Right, right. Which is going to cause a problem if they are parts used to complete whatever it might be, a, a, a television, an automobile, a piece of furniture. It creates that problem as well. And, and understand, too, in China today, their main port... They have problems with electricity. They have a problem with manpower. And they're likely running short on cargo containers. Because nothing is coming back to them. Right, right. So at some point in time, you're going to have this glut sitting over there ready to come back. And this armada is going to keep on coming until this system gets fixed. Now, the the big challenge is um, the port infrastructure needs to be improved. In the case of Long Beach... I don't think there's much more land to deal with. Right. So in, until you can improve the efficiency, and that's that takes someone to sit down and actually observe what happens. At, at Toyota, as an example, we have a department w- that works in our plants just on efficiency. And they'll sit and they'll observe what's going on on an assembly line to figure out where are we wasting time? How can, how can we change something to improve the safety or improve the efficiency of what we do? And it may just be something that saves two or three seconds, but it makes a huge difference over time. That same type of thought process has to go into fixing a complex problem. So like this. was this doomed to fail from the beginning? I mean, uh, I mean okay. should we be looking for the short term to get us back to this kind of a system? It seems to me one of the things we learned was there are some things like chips and medicine that maybe we should make here Mm -hmm. in America uh, for just for our, our own strategic, you know, uh, defense reasons. Right. Um, But does this system go back to the way it was? Well, I think the difficulty is if if you look at California, the ports in Long Beach, I believe they were up 
25 or 30 percent even last year. And this year they're up another 20 or 30 percent. And if you're landlocked and that much throughput is increasing, it was it was inevitable that you were going to have challenges unless you changed how you operated. Um, you know, the, the difficulty with just moving chips to the U.S. as an example, there are roughly 50 chip manufacturers in the world. Um, 50% of all the chips come out of Taiwan. 90, I need you to listen to this. 50% of all chips come out of Taiwan. Uh, roughly 90% of all the really high-tech, sophisticated chips come out of Taiwan. Um, most all the chips come out of somewhere in Asia. If it's not Taiwan, it's it's Japan, it's Vietnam. It's, it's China it's number places. two, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think if you add t- Taiwan and China together, they are by far the largest. So if Taiwan falls to China, they have a gun to our head. Uh, to, to the globe. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, and the difficulty is it takes a long time to build one of these plants, and they're very capital intensive. You know, a, a new chip plant today is 15 to $20 billion to build. So you can't exactly change that overnight. So um, we're going to continue our conversation here in, in uh, just a second. I, this is what, when you think about Build Back Better, which is just a slogan to change the financial uh, uh, strategy of our system, this is the kind of stuff that we should be talking about. Can we get a relief to help build chip manufacturing plants here in America? Can we can we redesign our ports? Instead, they're going they're going to green energy and all of this this garbage that is not going to help us out in the future to remain uh, ahead of the rest of the world, or at least even competitive with the rest of the world. Am I wrong with that assessment? That that. We're not doing the right, it doesn't seem like we're focused on the right things as a nation. Well, and part of it, I I think if you look at Build Back Better, there is money in there to build chip plants in the U.S. There is money in there. Yeah, and I think there's infrastructure to try and improve the ports. So, but it's being undershadowed by some of the rest of this garbage stuff. (laughs) I'll I'll say garbage. You you don't have to say garbage. Yeah. Um, So, you know, trying to get people prepared for the short term uh i've been saying for a while buy your christmas presents now Mm -hmm. uh because when they run out they run out right yeah no um what what industries do you think are going to be most affected how is the consumer going to be most affected by this do you have any idea well you know i I can speak primarily the car industry yeah uh you know right now consumers are spending a lot more for vehicles if you go in to buy a new car today, chances are there are they are not discounting them, because an industry that typically has good selection, sixty days worth of cars on on the ground, today they may have five days worth of cars on the ground. You were trying to buy a car uh, recently, and you couldn't get the options that you wanted. You were, yeah. I mean, it's and it's it's ordered, but it's. They just, they won't even give me a date and when they expect to deliver it. Yeah, because they may not know because yeah. they're not sure when the parts are going to come in. Because if, if you look at it, and, and chips are a big part of it, but an average car has anywhere from 50 to, say, 150 chips. If it's a hybrid or an EV, it may have thousands of chips. And the more sophisticated your car, the more chips it has. Anti-lock brakes. Um, lane departure warning, dynamic cruise control, navigation, all of that creates more chips. So is it possible that we are entering a time to where your car breaks down and you just don't have one for a while because it's just sitting in the shop, they don't have the parts? Yeah, I I mean, good news is, at least with chips, that doesn't happen very often, but sure. I mean, if, if, if you're bringing some of your parts from overseas... In our case, we buy $33 billion worth of parts a year in the U.S. So fewer and fewer and fewer come, but sure. Uh, You have a problem with your car, uh, your cruise control goes out and you need a new component. Uh, It may take quite a while to get it. And and, and as you mentioned, um, to be able to produce vehicles today, some of the manufacturers are reducing the, the options that are on them. 